All right, uh, welcome to the last panel. Uh, this panel is titled Voicing Out the Critique, How to Generate Countering Expressions. Uh, our first speaker is Susan Petty. Uh, sorry. Um, so, okay, before that, this is a multidisciplinary panel that has a specific focus on ethnographic methodologies, personal stories, everyday performances, and creative forms of expression. We will focus on orality and orality, the relationship between the textual, the oral, and the visual, and many other ways of voicing out the feminist critique, finding spaces of dissent, and countering expression. Uh, Susan. Petty is an honorary senior research associate at University College London. She is currently project manager of Engaging Refugee Narratives Perspectives from Academia and the Arts, based at US UCL. She is also the leader of the Armenian Diaspora Study Pilot Project, initiated by the Gulbenkian Foundation. She has a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her book, which I read when I was <laughs> really 20 years old, Faith in History, Armenian Rebuilding Community, um, one of the really like unique groundbreaking ethnographies um, as, as a social student I read, um, is an ethnography of Armenians in Cyprus and Armenian Cypriots who had migrated to the UK. Dr. Petty has since done research in Syria, North America and Armenia and authored a number of articles and chapters on Armenians living in diaspora. Co-founder and former director of the Armenian Institute in London, she co-authored a book titled Treasured Objects, Armenian Daily Life in the Ottoman Empire 100 Years Ago, and is the lead author of the children, children's book, Who Are the Armenians, also published in Turkish and Portuguese. She has also served as director of the Armenian Museum of America and as program manager of the National Armenian Genocide Centennial Commemorations in Washington, D.C. Dr. Petty taught for the Syracuse University London program and one term as visiting professor in the Armenian Studies program of the University of Michigan. So Susan is, as I said, one of the very few Armenian anthropologists. Uh, and as I said, when, when I was studying social anthropology, uh, it, it was a very empowering thing. We're talking about Armenian women scholars, but also this is something uh, like we don't have many Armenian anthropologists, we don't have many Armenian women anthropologists, so this is also uh, very empowering. And she wrote, as I said, one of the most important ethnographies of an Armenian diaspora community. Both her scholarship and organizational work contributed greatly to the visibility of Armenian women and to overcome gender blindness of Armenian studies. So we asked Susan um, to talk about the significance of feminist perspective in Armenian anthropology and what kind of methodological problems arise when feminist pers perspective is missing from the analysis of the formation of Armenian subjectivities. We also asked her to reflect on the importance of everyday, everyday performances, arts, and the material culture, artifacts, as sites of expression, because she worked on it and her book is on it. And uh, Susan will also talk about anthropology of as a way of hearing dissident voices, the experiences that were marginalized from the community, from the Armenian communities, seeing alternative uh, forms of bonding and creating a family, and many other exciting things. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Melissa. I guess I need, uh, do I need a, a microphone, yeah, or can you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You can This is fine, thanks. I think you can hear me now, right? Yes. Great, thank you, Melissa. That was really, really kind, thank you. And thank you to both of you, Lerna and Melissa. This is really exciting to be here and I greatly appreciate being invited. Um, and also, it's just, as all of you who have written a book know, it's nice to know somebody read it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's also, <laughs> we don't, and, um, and the questions that they gave me indicated that they really had read it, which was really even more amazing. So that was really great. The only problem was that as you heard her reading it, it's Im impossible to answer all of those in 15 minutes. So I'm gonna do my best to answer a couple of them, which is a bit lame, but I'll maybe over dinner. So 
Uh, I want to start just by saying, in addition to thank you to these w wonderful women, um, to have a little quote from what they sent out to us. They said, this project does not merely add women to an already formed narrative, but recomposes the entire history of a century by interweaving women's voices with each other and into the major historical moments of their times, both as shapers of these moments and sh subjects shaped by them. And I feel this is extremely important. It's also something that I, I tried to do in that book that you mentioned. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later, but I, I just wanted to use that as a jumping off point because I felt that was extremely important. The original title for our talk <laughs> was a little different. It was Voicing Out the Critique, How to Generate Countering Expressions, which is really interesting and kind of controversial too. Um, I found it especially intriguing in addition to all the other questions and um, I wasn't really sure whether I was being asked how I generate countering expressions from people I'm working with. Is this off now? Or no? Okay. I'm just or how I generate countering expressions for myself, because I am a kind of a countering person. I don't know. So, but it's all connected. Um, I try not to generate any kind of expression from the people that I'm working with. I try to listen to them, I try to make them comfortable enough to speak openly with me rather than sort of leading them into something I feel we probably do as anthropologists sometimes, but we try, we try not to. Um, one of the last requests in the commission sent to me by Lerna and Melissa was similar to this. What is the anthropologist's role in listening, understanding, and empowering expressions of dissent within the Armenian community? Armenian communities. For me, this is the key to the rest of the questions that I've been asked, basically. Um, and it's also fundamental to the richness of the gift of anthropology to the rest of Armenian studies, I feel, which is something I'm, uh, we givers of the gift sometimes feel a bit snubbed, frankly. <laughs> Too often, Armenian studies have been understood as historical studies, and more specifically, the history and consequences of the Armenian genocide, and within this narrow frame, the political public face of these events. I can only underscore the importance of all of this, and I'm glad that this work is being done. However, I am deeply disappointed that so little recogni recognition is given to anything else, as if we are only a people of the past, and in more recent years, only defined by our experience of the genocide. And around genocide recognition. Most serious is the lack of attention to the multiple ways of being Armenian and to the varied experiences of Armenian life in different contexts around the world and within specific communities as well. We have very little serious record, let alone analysis, of Armenian life in the 20th century diaspora. All of it's taken for granted, because we all sort of, everybody seems to feel like they already know what's going on. Um, it's taken as too ordinary, too mundane for, to merit attention. And this leads me to uh, several points which touch on some of the questions that were asked me as well. Um, for example, who gets the platform? Who gets to be the speaker? Um, how to interpret what is seen and experienced. And this is touched on again. I have, uh, having sat through the whole day, I hate to show you my paper, but I mean, I did write something, but it's totally scribbled over, so excuse me while I try to read my writing. How do we find out about the people who are not provided a public platform to speak? How do we find out about the people who do not fit the public vision of normal, whether that be through their sexuality, their daily routines, their beliefs, it takes time and it takes an appreciation of silence and waiting as research tools. It takes respect for any and all, not just for the accomplished, the elected, the loudest, and not only for the public figures of a community. It also takes a somewhat anarchic view of life for yourself, a belief that what one is told is true is not necessarily what is practiced not always what is found behind a public facade. It requires curiosity and the development of a certain kind of radar that tingles when it meets people with definite ideas about how things are 
And here a little aside, I, I won't do a bio until a bit later, but <laughs> when I was at, at, um, in grad school, the, my supervisor who was Armenian, when he discovered I was Armenian, which I had hid from him, he said, I can do that, I'm half Armenian and I don't sound it like I am. So he pulled me out in his office and said, so you're Armenian? I said, yeah, <laughs> I confess. And he says, <laughs> he says, well, you know, being Armenian is a really good basic part of being an anthropologist because we're kind of insiders and outsiders at the same time. We, we are kind of a little bit anonymous more so than some other minority folks. And we are, uh, but we've, you know, we have this kind of internal radar for things that are different. And I thought, you know, that makes sense. I always felt that way. Um, I have some examples from my field work in Cyprus and with Cypriot Armenians in, in London, which, which fit in with this. Uh, within my first days, I mean, anybody who visits another community is always told what's up, what's what, but if you go there saying you want to learn about them, naturally they're gonna tell you. And the, the first thing that people would tell me is we have no beggars, we have no divorce, and no crime. And this was in the uh, 1980s. Well, as a divorced person myself, I thought, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> we'll see what happens. And, but within a couple of months of field work, I'd interviewed several men and women in the oldest generation there who had been divorced themselves in the 1920s and the 1930s before remarrying and living a li life of acceptance in the community. Did nobody know about this? No, yeah, they did know about it. I spoke with women who told me about their neighborhood friend, Pembe Hanem, who would often join their coffee sessions in the 1940s. She was not only Turkish, but she had been a prostitute. But the women enjoyed her company. Is this something that they had told me was a normal thing to do? No, not at all. But it's the kind of thing you notice after a while, and actually people just tell you about it. In spite of people constantly reminding me to write that marrying an Armenian and raising children was the most important calling for both men and women, of course, especially women, there were a surprising number of single older adults. I mean, a lot. And please don't tell me it's because of the genocide. This is not, not by then. Both male and female. Clearly, something else had been more important, but what? Even they would tell me that it is most important to marry an Armenian, though their own lives showed that this had not, for them, been the most important thing. Eventually, I began to think of them simply as different kinds of families, as I believe they did, though they did not articulate this, but they certainly demonstrated it. Family is important, but particular shapes of families, less so. Um, I want to mention at this point that earlier talks today mentioned um, a connection between translation and anthropology, which I feel is very, very important, very strong. But one of them spoke of the difficulties of writing commu and communicating ideas that you, the translator or the anthropologist, uh, might disagree with. Um, do you just admit it? You can't include anything, uh, everything. That was Diana, I think. And um, now, so for me, when the subject was nationalism, which became the actually the topic that I was writing about, that for me became extremely difficult. Uh, because I really didn't agree with a lot of the ways that people were talking. And you have to, as an anthropologist, train yourself somehow. And I'm not very good at this, I confess. I have a very plastic face, I'm afraid. Um, how, how, how to sort of, not exactly disguise what you feel, but to give them space and respect for their opinions. And then, how do you write about it? It, it is indeed very difficult. But the other thing moment that anthropology was mentioned today, I, I would like to just uh, correct, I'm afraid, is that um, anthropology has changed radically s in the last, say, 40 years, really 40 years ago. We, we are not the pawns of the colonial powers anymore. At the same time, you know, there's a, well, what can I say? By the time I began studying anthropology at Michigan, our department, both the faculty and the students, were about 50% women and men. Uh, the active faculty, I should say. And the women's movement of the 60s and the 70s had set off an earthquake in the discipline. And we were very fortunate, those of us beginning at that time, 
um, to be able to begin with these people and with these tools and ideas. Um, there was an idea then that the anthropologist up till then had, like Levi Strauss, like how did he get into the middle of the jungle? Well, he had a whole retinue of people helping him and carrying all his stuff, as did many other people going out from Oxford and Cambridge. Well, the rest of us didn't by then. But also we were told that we had to make ourselves part of what we were writing about, that we couldn't just pretend we were a fly on the wall. I had to explain that, okay, I was an American in the Middle East. That's not always the greatest thing. We were even then. And I was an Armenian, I thought, but they didn't think so because I was half Armenian, I was Protestant, you know, all kinds of strikes against me. And worst, worst of all, I didn't speak Armenian, uh, but I did learn. <laughs> and then, you know, these are all things that, as my pr supervisor had said, made me both an insider and an outsider, which was, which was very helpful, frankly, in the end. But you can't pretend that all of this doesn't matter. It really does. It affects your relationship with the people that you're working with, and you are supposed to from the 80s be including this in, in what you're writing. So I didn't want to do a female-centered thesis, feeling that this would not show the dynamics of how women interact in the world. There's certainly room for this and indeed uh, a need for that kind of work. And many of these kind of books have gone very far, I think, in showing the complexity and richness of female experiences, which was almost entirely missing in the past. But my own field work in writing instead aimed to show what I had observed, the ways in which men and women work together and apart to create and pass on family, community, cultural values, and ideas that they felt were important. But also how women worked in and around the structures of society. Now, many people have remarked on how amazingly our grandmothers and great-grandmothers now picked up the pieces of the genocide and bravely and constructively moved forward. I actually, I had the privilege of witnessing women who were doing the same thing after the huge losses of the Armenian community in Cyprus in 1963 and again after the invasion of 74. In many families, again, it was the women who found or created work first actively taking advantage of this break in the fabric of life to do things that they had wished to do before and hadn't been able. Many of them started a business, got a further degree, taught. Many husbands were broken by the loss of their jobs and homes and thus their identity. Their identity had been entirely bound up in this aspect of their lives. And some never did work outside the home again, but helped around the house, in some cases proudly and in others secretly. And in others, of course, not at all working around the house, but choosing to solve the problems of the world at the taverna. I also felt in my field work that I needed to interview those men and women who were ignored as outsiders, who were dissidents in their own ways, though they probably felt they were just carrying on with their own lives rather than protesting. At that time, in the 1980s, People with alternative sexual practices had mostly moved away from the communities in Cyprus and in London sort of gotten lost in, in the you know, crowd of London. But this has changed radically in the last 30 years within the both Armenian communities that I've worked with mostly, as it has in the wider world. Um, and when I was told in 83 that there were no beggars and no criminals, no divorces, etc., um, alternative sexualities were not even mentioned because they didn't exist. No, of course not. Um, but if people could believe that divorce didn't exist, they could also believe that this didn't exist. Um, it was really only as families became uh, faced with losing a son or a daughter that this, this began to change. And, and of course the world around them changed. It's really very different now, both in Cyprus and in London. In the 20th century, many households were make up, made up of brother, br sister, 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 brother, brother combinations. These were alternative forms of family and usually extensions of a wider fam of a, of a larger family. Within those households, these people acted very much like heterosexual couples. It was very interesting to visit them. 
Um, but just like the other couples, they accommodated to changing circumstances and the boundaries of these roles were frequently broken, as I say, with the other couples as well. But that's not, again, what people said was going on. I'm almost done. The promise of ethnography is a richly detailed description of a group of people, whether a neighborhood or a tribe or an ethnic community or a corporation. From this, we pull out our own interpretations, theoretical analyses, and so on. But without the stories of the variety of lives within that community, we have no idea how change comes about. We have no idea why people drift off across the borders of a community. We have no idea what's happening below the surface of public discourse. Finally, I was asked, and I, I haven't spent enough time on this, the, the importance of everyday life perform uh, performances, arts, and the material cultural artifacts. I would just point you out to the importance of poetry in Armenian communities in the Middle East, and Cyprus included, and the Londoners, the importance of textiles in the arts, but it's also about performance of self. Michael Hertzfeld's important study, The Poetics of Manhood, Contest and Identity in a Cretan Village, um, was a groundbreaking study of performance of identity, including dis this dense description that I'm talking about, enabling the reader to enter a different world and understand how the anthropologist came to his own conclusions and perhaps allow the reader to see other aspects of the culture and come to different conclusions. How do people, men and women, act through the layers of self, relationships, culture, community, and the infrastructure of society around them? It's not a matter of celebrating diversity so much as being aware of and being able to communicate to others the diverse ways in which people work out and actually perform who they are and who they are and what they care about and how they hope to pass it on. And doing as, as Lerna and Melissa have suggested, we recompose history, recompose our notions of what is worthy of attention, and recompose ourselves constantly as we do this. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Huri Gattarian. Uh, Huri Atarian is an assistant professor in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at the American University of Armenia, and is also a core member of the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. She has obtained her PhD from the Faculty of Education, McGill University. Visual arts-based methodologies are a core facet of her research endeavors, Anchored in the blurred genre of life history and autobiographical inquiry, her work focuses on storying memory and identity through visual and narrative explorations. Her re research creation projects draw together difficult memories and marginalized histories of violence within a framework of public pedagogy. Um, Hurik and I performed uh, presented on many uh, common spaces occasions uh, here at MIT a couple of years ago. So, um, of course, Hurik has been engaged in research on storytelling, life storytelling, uh, and we asked her questions, of course, about um, her work on Armenian women's um, narration of the self, narration of their life trajectories, and why she chose, why it is so important to do research on Armenian women or gender studies and use uh, oral history as an important uh, methodology. And uh, in today's talk, we will see amazing things in a, in a second, uh, but before that, uh, because she's an incredible artist herself as well. I admire her. Uh, but she invites us to think about feminist methodologies, embodied ways of knowing, multiple subjectivities, and how we positions our, position ourselves in the world. How do we intervene? But beyond intervening, how can we all together disrupt the hegemonic and the normative to open up space to be able to breathe? I guess, to create a new life instead. I'm kind of 
taking it. Away. This is a huge. This is a tall. You order. see how she is inspiring me. You see, she always has been an inspiration for me. Sorry. Um, Hurik draws attention to the very act of listening, just like Susan did, how it can be transformative, healing, but at the same time challenging, disturbing. Uh, and she will also make us think about ethical ways of listening, li difficult life experiences. Wow, tall order. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is it working? Yeah? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, a very big and heartfelt thank you to Lerna and Melissa uh, for really dragging out the kitchen table. And I mean this term in the Lori Nilsenian uh, sense, and I'll be talking about her in a little while, for uh, dragging out the kitchen table out into the public arena, uh, finally. Uh, with its deep resonance of the personal is political. And also for opening up an opportunity for all of us here to draw our own genealogy. And thank you for that beautiful uh, analogy at the uh, beginning of this workshop in the morning. And uh, so to draw our own uh, genealogy here with this intergenerational workshop. As I was thinking about this workshop, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, the probing questions Lerna and Melissa uh, brought up and about the possible stories I could tell here. I went back to reread some of the feminist scholars who have accompanied my journey of inquiry over the years. This rereading with renewed purpose brought some new questions to light for me, which I'd like to share with you all today. They may also very well be a wish list in terms of imagining the feminist interventions uh, you ask us to think about here individually and collectively today. I must also admit that oftentimes I find my work confronted by the non-existence and the absence of some of these questions in our intellectual communities and discourses. <coughs> uh, and I want to kind of weave in and out of uh, what I do to give you a background also, uh, and uh, also lead to some of the questions and the wish list I compiled. In academies, what I do would sound uh, something like this. My work is interdisciplinary, straddling between uh, educational studies, oral history, and women's studies. Methodologically, I find myself in the blurred boundaries of narrative inquiry, life history research, autobiographical inquiry, research creation work, and all of these informed by the bigger arc of feminist ways of knowing. In lay terms, what drew me to life history research, and uh, you can turn on the, uh, you'll just get to see um, photos of my uh, different works as a slideshow. So in lay terms, what drew me to life history research, to life writing, to oral history, initially was my fascination with stories, having grown up with survivor stories, but also ultimately having grown up with my grandmothers and most particularly with my maternal grandmothers, stubborn silences. And I loved it a lot, Susan, that you talked about silence as a research tool now. It just resonated so deeply. Uh, these evolved over the years into exploring life stories of women and girls who have experienced war and displacement. I have been particularly interested in intergenerational narratives, um, looking at stories of grandmothers, mothers, daughters, and granddaughters, probing how inherited stories uh, impact constructions and negotiations of identity and agency. With my long-term engagement with memory work, I came to realize that I had to explore my own researcher situatedness in order to better comprehend my embeddedness in my research interests. Doing so became key to understand myself and my subjectivity. Self-reflexivity, a rigorous peeling away of the layers of the self and constant questioning of perceptions became a key tool to explore my researcher subjectivity. In other words, you could say that my research encounters led me to a deep soul-searching experience. 
listening to and trying to comprehend the deeper folds of my narrator's uh, life stories also led me back to explore the silences in my family's stories and to see them under a new light. This is how, for example, I discovered new hidden layers in the stories of my two great aunts, both of them lost during the genocide and refound years later. Their compelling narratives also embody tales of loss and survival, silences and secrets, written out on boundaries of women's bodies. Looking for, unraveling, and listening to these stories was probably the most difficult challenge I faced, namely the creation of dialogic spaces within a research process marked by vulnerability and fragility. I turned more and more into visual and performative languages to chart the difficult silences and fractured memories, looking for fragments and traces in archival records along the way. Utilizing the archival material as literal sites of story making, I became interested in how a visual language can be connective, uh, bridging with the textual, especially when the latter encounters the impossibility of verbalizing difficult memories. Lori Nielsen, in Knowing Her Place, Research Literacies and Feminist Encounters, argues eloquently on how our lives as feminist researchers are written large into our works. She says, feminist perspectives have shown us how the flesh of story embraces, disturbs, and connects more strongly than disembodied, neutralized text. We are learning that we are no longer mere creators of text. We are texts ourselves. This is perhaps at the top of my wish list in terms of feminist interventions in Armenian studies, to see a deeper interjection of embodied ways of knowing made explicit by looking more closely at what feminist methodologies contribute in understanding our multiple subjectivities, positioning, situatedness. And maybe we want to think about and conceptualize not just about feminist interventions, but disruptions as well. At the very beginning, I thanked Lerna and Melissa for the kitchen table and dragging it out into this public arena. This is not just about a metaphorical perception of that kitchen table as a place of possibilities and renewal, but it necessitates a deeper conversation about stance and authority in research and in embedded inquiry. It is Laurie Nielsen ag again who explains and says, what I have come to call the kitchen table inquiry aims to collapse the distinctions that compartmentalize the way we have learned to view our work and our lives. It aims to disrupt the formal and public processes and products of traditional research and the systemic relations that rule them. It aims to create a space in the academy to make our inquiring selves as researchers the subject of our own inquiry the daily micropolitical acts, the many issues, circumstances, and challenges of the ordinary, which reveal the politics of our behavior in all our conflicting identities. The work at this table, like the person who does it, is purposeful. It is inquiry that aims to make visible in research what has not been made visible, and hence not valued. The question here for me is whether we are willing to give space to this engaged and, th in, uh, and to those who are engaged in these types of multiple voicing, ways of knowing and recounting that knowing. In my work on attempting to understand women's and girls' experiences of loss, displacement, exile, dispossession, trauma of an inherited, I too, like Sherna Berger Gluck and Daphne Patai, have felt driven by a sense of urgency to recover women's words. My discovery of their seminal anthology, Women's Words, the Feminist Practice of Oral History, in my very early years of doing graduate work, continues to reverberate in my academic and personal life with the collaborative research creation work that I now do in translating oral history into performance and most important of all, in exploring a new methodological language that links the visual and the textual. It also makes me immensely happy that part of this work will appear in a new anthology 
which is a look back at women's words after a 27-year aperture, and uh, it's called Beyond Women's Words, uh, the Personal, Political, and Ethical Challenges of Doing Feminist Oral History. Elsewhere, I've written that in questioning how storied lives and lived lives intertwine, what we can make of silences and gaps in texts, and whether the function of memory is present or past-oriented, Liz Stanley argues for a nuanced understanding of the relationship between text and context, while foregrounding the role of researcher reflexivity. She reminds us of the centrality of the researcher as an active interpretational presence. And engaging in narrative inquiry through merging autobiography and life story, anchoring family stories as a starting point to understand the stories of others, is my attempt to look critically at what these narratives tell us, how history bleeds into the present, how historical and contemporary terrains of suffering overlap sometimes, and what they have to do with our lives now. In doing so, I'm interested in claiming an alternative methodological space through my own language in exploring what my language can be, whether that is in textual or visual form, and in understanding the place of myself in all these stories. It is Gluck and Patai's work that initially led me to look into the importance of subjectivity and memory in shaping narratives which in turn brought me to a deeper prob probing of the multiple subjectivities involved in qualitative research, shedding an intimate, albeit difficult, light on the research process itself, looking at how the competing narratives of researcher and narrator intertwine and inform one another, learning that oral histories are not disembodied texts, but are rather the product of negotiation between narrator and researcher, researcher and text, text and reader, should make us aware, um, sorry, just lost my place, um, should make us aware of how we're engaged in constant <coughs> negotiations of meaning on multiple, on multiple levels at all times and make that transparent in our texts too. All of which bring me to the second item on my wish list nestled here, which has several subsets. First, with the repositories of oral history databases we have in Armenian studies, mostly on genocide testimonies, but also in attempts to look at community histories, it is time to probe them, not just as data sets on specific content, but ask questions on authority and stance on the power relations between interviewer and narrator that characterize much of the telling and recounting of these stories, questioning the interviewer's perceived authority that impact the narrative exchange in oral history interviews, and also on how the text and product are defined, among other things, with an understanding of subject subjectivity as a bridge between context and text, this certainly is an important intervention feminist perspectives can add and should have in Armenian <coughs> studies. Second, the lens needs to be widened to give more prominence in general to alternative qualitative research practices, including arts-based inquiry and engagements, various forms of life writing from oral history to performance to participatory action research to pedagogy to the emerging field of research creation in general, all of which can breathe new life into Armenian studies. And obviously, feminist methodologies, again, have much to contribute in this aspect as well. And since I mentioned pedagogy, it is also imperative to not only look at the history of Armenian women's education and historical studies of women educators, but also explore contemporary ethnographic studies of classroom teaching nested in discussions of feminist theory and feminist pedagogy. Finally, it is important to bring artists, practitioners, educators, activists who already work in some of these fields together with scholars to include them in wider conversations. Today's workshop is a very important first step in that sense, but ultimately and hopefully, we can look at different cross-sections of interests too, not only confined to scholarship, but which impact the wider field of Armenian studies. And I'm finishing my last point. Over the years, I found myself veering away from a center of Armenian studies into a margin of my own making, 
a periphery I made home. In conversations with colleagues and friends, I know that this is not uncommon. What has become crucial for me in this home and away place I have found is feminist mentorship. I have been lucky. I found that mentorship in my doctoral committee members during my graduate work and in colleagues and peers in my later years of research and teaching. And I want to indulge here a little bit and I want to acknowledge and I want you to uh, forgive that indulgence because I want to acknowledge some of the mentors who are present here today. Uh, Arli Navakian and Arpi Hamalian for their unwavering support and insight and also humor they provided over the years. And I learned never to underestimate the power of humor in dealing with dysfunctional patriarchal hierarchies in academia and also how they fuel the energy to struggle against it. In the meantime, I also want to add here very importantly, the peer support and sisterhood that I have been able to craft and carve out with Lerna and Melissa over the years, creating our own Academy of the Kitchen Table, continues to nurture me intellectually and personally. And so finally, I arrive at the last item on my wish list. I believe that for a heteroglossia of feminist interventions and disruptions to come into being, to grow and to flourish, creating nurturing dialogical po pockets of feminist mentorship is definitely a must. Thank you. Thank you, Huri. So from everyday performances to ways of remembrance and narrating with Talar, we are now continuing our conversation on politics and aesthetics in literary studies. Uh, Talar Shahinian holds a PhD in comparative literature from UCLA and lectures in the Department of Comparative World Literature and Classics at California State University, Long Beach. Her research interests include Western Armenian language and literature, transnational studies, politics and aesthetics, and translation. She served as assistant editor of Armenian Review between 2012 and 2017. Currently, she is the co-editor of Diaspora, a journal of transnational studies, very prestigious one, the, some, uh, a publication that we are aware of uh, contributed to our intellectual trajectories. Uh, even back in Turkey, we had a group um, reading the articles in that journal. Uh, she contributes regularly to the online journal Critics Forum and the literary magazine Pakin. So, um, we are very happy that Talar is with us uh, today and uh, we, we started this conversation, uh, the first step of this conversation because as a literary scholar, as a specialist on literature, uh, we, we asked her to talk about canon formation, uh, the gender ideology of canonization. Uh, Talar's uh, work focuses on the Menk movement, the post-World War I Parisian literary movement that consisted of uh, an all-male cast of uh, orphaned writers, and Talar today will talk about post-genocide reconfigurations of gender in diasporic communities from the perspective of literary history. She will focus uh, both on the Menk movement and the writings of post-World War II Armenian intellectuals in the Middle East, and she will analyze how they configured the genocide within the patriarchal paradigm that is, they configured this as a loss of, as the loss of the nation and the loss of the patriarchy. So, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I'm, I'm from the various questions that Melissa and Lerna posed v uh, via email. I decided to um, talk about my um, intellectual trajectory today, the the scholarly trajectory. And uh, I just have to say that I've been so invigorated and stimulated by all the discussions today. I've been sitting there all day since, morn um, since morning and mourning the uh, potential unwritten presentations that I could have presented on today. Um, <laughs> I, 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 this, this speaks volume to the, the necessity of this platform that your, your workshop has created. And I, I really thank you for the invitation. I feel really privileged uh, to be among all of you. All right. <coughs> so in a 1927 article entitled, Women in the Modern Social Order, 
published in the Parisian newspaper Harach. Vasken Shushanyan, an up-and-coming young male, I should say, writer, pronounces the following, and I quote, a woman we cannot forget, beyond being mother and the family's anchor, is also the source of our joy and happiness. In other words, she is simultaneously mother and forgive my pagan explanation, a lover. <laughs> In what he naively presents as a progressive reframing, Shushanyan brings together two seemingly conflicting views of womanhood, arguing that motherhood and desirability are not mutually exclusive. In this article, Shushanyan attempts to reconcile a socialist understanding of women's rights with a nationalist understanding of women in the Armenian context. While he adamantly advocates for equal rights and calls for the protection of women's sexual autonomy, his at times contradictory statements that continue to imagine women as both mother and object of desire hints to the paradoxical, not to say confused, relationship that emergent Armenian writers had with modernity in their post-genocide displaced setting. Shushanyan was a member of a Parisian literary movement called Menk, meaning we. Formed in the late 1920s, the group gathered a number of writers, an all-male cast, who belonged to the orphaned generation, meaning those who survived the genocide as children. I first came across the story of this group in Krikor Baladian's then newly released 2001 French publication of 50 years of Armenian literature in France. The coincidence was timely. I had just started my graduate work at UCLA and was immersed in Francophone literature and thereby theories of memory and exile. Naturally, I was drawn to what I immediately recognized as a forgotten archive in the exiled Western Armenian language. How was it possible that I, someone who had attended Diaspora's Armenian schools, who had studied modern Armenian li literature as an undergrad, and who was well-versed, I thought, in Diaspora's cultural history, had missed the story of this group? As I tallied their immense literary output, I was further puzzled puzzled at how little I recognized the names of the 15 signatories. With the exception of Shahan Shahnur and a, vaguely, and a vague familiarity with names like Nigoros Sarafian, Nisham Beshik Tashlian, and Shavash Nartuni, these authors remained, remained unknown to me. Excitedly, I approached their published works, thinking that within their prose writing, I would find an articulation of genocide memory that resembled the historical events grand narrative which I was all too familiar with. To my surprise, the works of these French Armenian writers were devoid of any explicit memory of the catastrophic events of the past, yet they consistently portrayed a crisis of survival in the aftermath of the genocide for both the survivor living in exile and the displaced cultures prospects of reproduction. All of this to say that the origins of my scholarship are based in an attempt to read into absence in a dual sense. One, the absence of genocide memory in the works of Menk, and two, the absence of Menk in the Western Armenian literary canon. With regard to the first absence, my work consisted of developing a theory of indexical representation that examined tra trauma through the lens of belatedness and aftermath experience. Within the framework of early generation trauma theory, theorists point out the complete rupture of all human sense-making mechanisms for the survivor amidst and in the wake of catastrophe and assert that traumatic experience produces a temporal gap causing a crisis of witnessing and thereby a crisis of self. In this vein, the autobiographical fiction of Menk writers address the paradox of representation inherent to the experience of catastrophe through themes like incest and the figure of the failed witness. The male protagonists of their novels are often faced with the impossible task of replacing their lost fathers within the surviving family structure. They struggle with chronic illness, impotence, unemployment, and depression hinting at feelings of shame, guilt, and a crisis of witnessing related to, their, to both their survival and their inability to reinstate the family structure. Within the incest narratives, we see a similar male perspective of the collapse of social and familial order following the genocide. 
Told from the perspective of brother, these narratives unquestioningly imply the brothers' position of authority in their post-patriarchy setting. The reconstitution of patriarchy presents itself as the imperative mandated by the absence of the father, yet as something that is impossible to achieve because of incest. The work suggests, the, the works suggest that in dispersion, the young Armenian male's gravitation toward the same, represented through the figure of the sister, is always incestuous and detrimental to the continuation of family. And gravitation toward the other, represented through the figure of the French prostitute, inevitably results in acculturation. In other words, Menk writers, in their literary output, conceive of the genocide's catastrophic outcome as the collapse of social order and therefore narrate the genocide as loss of patriarchy. While I recognized that these narratives of lost patriarchy and incest could be problematic, especially if adopted as sources of national allegory, what I wished to highlight in my work was how Menk writers eluded the grand cultural narrative that emerged following World War II and that excluded them from the canon of diaspora's literary production. Which brings me to the second absence. The work of the, of the Menk generation remains largely untranslated and inaccessible, for diaspora institutions have not reprinted or republished them. By situating the meaning of testimony within the complicated relationship among trauma, survival, language, and memory, Menk presents us with an alternative archive for understanding the complexities of aesthetic representation in the aftermath of genocide. Following World War II, when Beirut took over as the nucleus of diaspora's political, intellectual, and literary activity, and sought to construct a unified and coherent narrative of the genocide in the diaspora, it positioned itself as a connecting thread to the pre-1915 literary tradition and excluded Menk from the modern Armenian literary canon due to the group's attempts to understand diasporic experience as interrupted time. Whereas the post-World War I writers in Paris embraced their exilic condition, rejected tradition, and attempted to carve out a new transnational literature, the post-World War II writers in Lebanon and Syria set out to develop a national literature in Western Armenian against the backdrop of an imagined unified homeland. So while Menk's literary activity during the interwar period was the focus of my doctoral dissertation, my subsequent research studied the period following World War II and traced the history of the Armenian diaspora's processes of canon formation in the Middle East. Within this comparative frame, I could situate Menk as an alternative archive that informs the politics of language vitality in a, in a diasporic setting. The project is the basis of my current book manuscript, which focuses on two key moments in Western Armenian literary history, so post-World War I Paris and post-World War II Beirut, to A, examine how a stateless language sustains itself in exile, and B, critique the model of world literature in its reluctance to expand the practice of literary history to account for stateless literatures that elude international canonization. In the years following World War II, those once referred to as Turkish Armenians, the dispersed community Armenians, migrant Armenians, or Armenians abroad, came to be known collectively as the diaspora, which came to imagine itself as a transnationally organized homogenous entity. The latter part of my research focuses on this period of transition to examine the making of diaspora's grand narrative founded on the notion of national cultural production and exile. Therein, I argue that the articulation of diaspora's narrative was occasioned by two rival conferences. The Second Congress of the Soviet Armenian Writers' Union, which was held in Yerevan in 1946 for a select group of uh, um, uh, diaspora writers, and uh, where a select group of diaspora writers were invited, I should say, and a reactionary conference organized by the Writers' Association of Syria and um, Lebanon, held in Shtora, Lebanon in 1948. These rival conferences, once again overwhelmingly male spaces, 
caused diaspora intellectuals to realize the threat facing Western Armenian language in exile, and incidentally positioned Beirut as, and more broadly the Middle East as the hub for centralization and standardization of Western Armenian language and literature. As a result, by the 1950s, educational institutions became potent markers of centering as they joined the larger apparatus of language standardization and thereby became the means, um, a means of the narrative construction of the diaspora. Under this rubric, um, I examined the poetry of three members of the Writers' Association of Syria and Lebanon, Musher Ishran, uh, Garo Sassouni, and Levon Shant, who emerged as educators in the burgeoning Armenian day school scene of, of Beirut. Their poetry celebrating the Armenian language as a symbolic territory and thereby perpetuate, perpetuating the myth of a unified homeland and the myth of return formed the canon of Western Armenian literature, which was subsequently incorporated into textbooks and anthologies. Because the appearance of this literary trope coincided with a political campaign to forge an Armenian vernacular that was free of uh, dialectic and Turkish influence, I argue that with this move from prose of the Menk generation to poetry of the Beirut generation, art in the diaspora gained a new framing as a national literature in exile rather than a transnational literature in dispersion, which is what the, uh, the, the Menk generation was trying to carve out. Another way of articulating this comparison is as follows. If the Paris scene reconfigured genocide as loss of patriarchy, Armenian intellectuals of the post-World War II uh, Beirut scene assigned a similarly patriarchal configuration to the genocide and saw it as loss of nation. Within these parallel configurations, two significant literary tropes emerge that imagine women as either sister or mother. In the case of the former, the Armenian woman is seen as an obstacle to the reconstitution of patriarchal order. In the case of the latter, the Armenian woman is seen as the transmitter of language and tradition and as a necessary component of the nation-building project in the diaspora. Too intent on positioning Menk as an alternative archive that could instruct us on Western Armenian literary production and language vitality, I have failed to turn my scholarly attention to, the yet, to, to yet a third absence that lies within the aforementioned paradigms. Female voices are absent in the construction of both these literary and intellectual spaces that produce these gendered narratives. This workshop has allowed me to think through this latter form of uneven representation to suggest that what we're talking about is not an absence after all, rather a case of exclusion. <laughs> Women are always there, in fact, in their writing. Uh, contemporaneous to the Menk group, um, there are French-Armenian writers like Louisa Aslanian, known as Las, uh, Ellen Puzant, uh, Zarui Bahri uh, in, in France, at the time, uh, Mary Atmajian. They are simply left in the margins of the flurry of activity, like the weekly uh, writers group meetings and the association meetings, uh, the, the group formations, editorial boards uh, of the literary journals, um, and the, in, in, uh, as signatories of these manifesto-like announcements that are coming out uh, uh, in these journals. And that produced the, all of these, uh, the, the flurry of activity, which produced structures of authority that shaped a transnational literary discourse. I should also um, add that uh, Sidon Seza is the same as Seza that ends up in Lebanon. Yeah. So she's there at the 48 meeting as an invited guest, but is not uh, given a p a, the platform to, to be part of the, the program and the not, the, not out of the content in terms of the program. Um, <clears throat> the, the transnational space of post-genocide Western Armenian literary history, therefore, consists of a story of competing centers. In other words, the Beirut scene, which shaped the literary canon, imagined itself dialogic dialogically with and against the Parisian activity of the interwar period and with and against Soviet Armenia. Menk, in this way, um, and in the way that it has been deliberately forgotten, was and is still part of dominant discourse, 
while the realm of the third absence that I've identified, women writers, never had access to that discourse to, to begin with. If it's at the intersection of historical circumstance and narrative that hegemonic power gets shaped, then the history of the genocide um, conceived of as an identity-defining moment um, with its gendered narratives needs a, 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 a critical glance and a makeover. Thereby, in thinking about the uneven processes of canon formation that these narratives have produced, what we need to think about is not the absence of women writers, rather the necessity of having women literary critics who in their capacity to curate can overturn the mechanisms of editorship and access to critical discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Tala. This is very weird to say this, but as, as the organizer, co-organizer of this workshop, but I'm learning a lot today. <laughs> so really, this is great. So our uh, next speaker is Arpi Hamalyan, uh, who is Hurik's mentor, but <laughs> also our mentor in a way, because we have been um, exchanging emails over years uh, with her. And um, really, this is a great honor to uh, have her here today. Arpi Hamalyan is a professor in the Department of Education at Concordia University. She has served as chair of the Department of Education director of the graduate programs in both edu education studies and adult education. She's an honorary life fellow of the Simone de Beauvoir Institute, Concordia's internationally renowned women's studies college. She served as the president of the Concordia University Faculty Association and president for the Quebec Federation of University Associations and Unions. She's a mentor and thesis and dissertation supervisor to over 300 graduate students. She has played she has played a leading role in education policy development bodies in Canada and the USA and in 21 different countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, Eurasia, and the Middle East. Her awards include the Governor General's 125th Anniversary Medal for Service to Community and Country, Student Life Award for Excellence in Teaching, and the Alumni Award for Excellence in Teaching from Concordia University, Women of Distinction in Teaching by the uh, YWCA in Montreal, and in 2016, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Canadian Association for the Study of Adult Education, as well as Women of the Year Awards from Armenian Women's Organizations in Quebec. So, uh, RP is the founder and principal of the Simone de Beauvoir Institute at Concordia University, and throughout six years, she chaired the institute and collaborated with women from uh, different ethnic and racial backgrounds in Canada. So we asked her to reflect on that experience, obviously because very, we are very uh, interested and excited to hear about that. We also wanted her to, to talk about her own approach to pedagogy and especially feminist pedagogy uh, and how it can be applied to the Armenian educational institutions. And as uh, I, as we said, as Rick said and I said, she's a very inspiring mentor for younger Armenian women in academia. And we also wanted to know where she saw the importance of having an Armenian woman scholar as a mentor for an Armenian struggling in a non-Armenian academia, especially as a woman. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Excellent, thank you very much. I mean, that was uh, a bio that I use for other uh, purposes. But yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I started to kind of you know, do it quickly. But I have been thinking since then, and then I have to develop one now for the Armenian uh, studies kind of angle. Uh, anyways, I decided that I'm going to answer some of those questions, but uh, unlike Talar, who was mourning, I decided, well, I'm going to kind of leave aside what I have written, and I'm going to talk about what I got inspired about hearing here. And then I thought that I had heard everything, made some notes, but then I come to this panel, and then first of all, you know, Hurik acknowledges me as matter, then, you know, Melissa gets in, the, in that game, etc. But I have to say that they themselves have been mentoring
sharing and you know, uh, in very efficient ways, in the very effective ways, and being very modest about it. And I'm going to use uh, one of the, you know, a daughter-in-law of the Armenians. <laughs> Her name is Mary Catherine Bateson, the daughter of uh, Gregory Bateson and uh, Margaret Mead. And then she says that we should start paying loving attention to what has not been loved so far. And I think, you know, I will really uh, congratulate you, Melissa and uh, uh, Lerna for paying loving attention to the subject that you are paying at, uh, and looking at and to talking about her story. Talking about her story, as you are saying, is not to uh, uh, kind of uh, throw out the history that we know, but you know, to uh, make really relevant her story. Because it, especially in the Armenian case, at several uh, occasions, her story is more important than his story because his story was either massacred or sent to jail or whatever. I give the example of Dignak Papkasun Hayot Sashkari. One of the questions is if you have to rewrite the Armenian history, how will you rewrite it? Well, you rewrite it from the woman's point of view. Okay, we know about Vartanats, about, uh, uh, about the princes and the leaders, this, that, and the other. And, you know, they go and then, you know, uh, kind of uh, the women hear that after being held hostage, they may be coming back because they have changed their religion, right? Well, the women organize the army, go to the border. They are not going to let these traitors come back in. Okay, so that, you know, why don't we write that story? We start from that story, then we acknowledge the work that the uh, Vartanans did, but then, you know, like, why should they be the central uh, uh, storyline, you know? But it is complementary, it is not one against the other, but we have not done that work. And it is really very Shnor uh, Hagal courts, as we say in Armenian, that you are doing. So I congratulate you for that. I'm sitting here and then Patty is saying that, you know, she uh, studied at Michigan State, I mean, Michigan University. And of course, my anthropology professor was a graduate, Louise Sweet, uh, and she was a student of uh, Leslie White. And she is the one who really encouraged me in terms of bringing in m our contribution, the Armenian contribution, to the history of uh, anthropology in general or different areas in which she was working. She has several volumes uh, entitled uh, People and Culture of the Middle East. And then, you know, uh, what happened is that while working on that, uh, also we were all in dialogue, etc. She kept on asking me, what have Armenians done in this? What have Armenians, where, do, where are they? I cannot find any resources. So I'll tell her stories, and I'll take her home, and my parents will tell her stories. And <laughs> therefore, uh, she in many different ways contributed my, of my kind of taking interest in working and talking academies about this subject. Today I'm not going to talk academies, but you know, if you want some of those uh, publications are there, you can look at them. But uh, she also, uh, for several occasions, when the National Geographic, for example, there were uh, particular articles or maps or whatever about the Middle East, the Near East, etc. she will send letters correcting them, and then they'll have corrections published. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, uh, gave me this business of thinking about being an enabler rather than, oh, this I cannot do, that I cannot do. And that is why, in many ways, when I came to academia and I came to uh, Quebec, I decided, you know, the thing to do is, as we talk about, get to sovereign positions. <laughs> so that you are the sovereign, and then you decide how things should work. <laughs> And that is how I got involved in terms of the uni unions and this, that, and the other. And of course, the Simone de Beauvoir story comes there. But another thing is that it is very important. I started teaching adult education because I was teaching anthropology, qualitative methods, etc. And then the university decided not to hire adult educators anymore on that subject. And then I decided I'm going to teach them. So we're not going to let this disappear. And therefore, uh, that is when I started thinking, you know, about what we learn outside of academy. And then where I learned my Armenian her stories, and uh, it is very interesting that one of them is very much linked to hygiene. Uh, what, what I am doing now, that I am not so under pressure for publishing for tenure and promotion, etc., I am translating uh, 
Women's Diaries. And uh, the first one I started, we were now at the seventh one we are doing, but then the first one started when I saw an ad in, you know, I was looking at Zorian here, there, and the other, and there was this woman asking, you know, somebody can translate my grandmother's diaries because I want to know my history. And then the mother would talk about it. She wouldn't want to hear it because the mother was Armenian, the father was uh, English. And uh, the father had come as a Salvation Army person to a camp in uh, France, in Marseille, and then that's where they got married. And she never wanted to hear the Armenian side of the story because it was sad. Now the mother had Alzheimer's, and now she wants to learn about the, her Armenian side history. And then they discovered the grandmother's diary. They were trying to translate the grandmother's diary, and then what happened is that uh, Zorian and several others sent it to translators, and the answer will come back. These are the rumblings of a peasant woman. We are not going to waste our time. <laughs> and I said, well, so I translated it, and it is uh, Valenta Valentin Shahbarlian, her name is, she's from Van, and then herself and her sisters, all of them were kind of you know, very interesting people. One of the sisters is Lucy Targul. Lucy Targul that ended up in Armenia, whereas they ended up in Mamashte. And Lucy Targul became a very famous writer in Armenia. Now, the tie to Haigin is that Lucy Targul decided to criticize the uh, <laughs> nomenclatura in Armenia. So she wrote an article about the zoo, going to the zoo and seeing, you know, the lion and seeing you know, who oppresses who, etc. And then she sent it out to Haigin for publication. She couldn't publish it there. She published it in Haigin. <laughs> and so that, do you see, like, if you start paying attention to your life and the stories you learn and how everything is kind of interrelated. Brings us to César, uh, Silan César. Well, when I was uh, adolescent and trying to kind of figure what to wear and how to wear, etc., you do like Siran César, okay? <laughs> and she was doing like Simone de Beauvoir, you know? And then even like cigarette, you have like a little bit of this, you know, like holder and stuff like that. So you become Siran César. Now, the parents, everybody, you know, on the one hand, they admire Siran César. On the other hand, you know, like, you know, this is not a model that maybe it is good. <laughs> Because you may not find a husband, right? <laughs> Although Siran Seza found not only a husband, but uh, you know she had many lovers, and it is interesting to see, the imagined or not, in the community they were saying that oh, it's real, you know. But uh, when you read Vahe Vahyan's uh, uh, book, Vahe Vahyan's book, uh, in its um, uh, it is the third part of the heart of the poet. You know, it's the heart of the poet in 2012. The third part is intimate letters. And the intimate letters, he talks about how at the age of 24, he was totally in love with the, old, with the younger sister of uh, uh, César. And then <laughs> later on, with César herself. And uh, he talks about it in such interesting ways. And the Armenian in there is just perfect, you know, it's a special, special formulation to express this kind of love. Of course, other writers, for example, Kom Oshagan, will say that, well, you know, Armenian literature is not aru, is not a, is not male, because people like Vahavahian, et cetera, who had the hold on Armenian literature at the time, were writing in very beautiful language, which was not an aru language, it was Really, you know, I mean, you would want a, fe uh, a feminist man writing about love, you know? So these are all the kinds of different things that we do not pay attention to. It is very important. Now, in terms of Yerdasat uh, Hayuhi, I have to say that that was also a major influence, but again, there are ties, because Hurig's mother was the correspondent, the journalist, uh, uh, Arsene Tarian, in Yerdasat Hayuhi, on matters that had to do with Arab culture, Arabic culture, and through that, you know, we all got introduced to Arab writers, etc. Although we were studying Arabic, reading Arabic, but what we were reading in uh, Yerdasat Hayuhi was very different because we were studying all the men, and then in Yerdasat Hayuhi, she was writing about the women writers. So, uh, like, you know, do you see the ties, and do you see where we got kind of our inspiration, and this idea of being enablers? 
I would like all of you to think about that, because I think all of you can be enablers and then look at enabling uh, mentors or uh, you know, uh, people in your background. It is very important to do that, because we always say that this one did this to us, the other one did this to us, we didn't, couldn't do this. It is true. They are there. I can tell you the stories. But uh, for example, you know, I was writing uh, and going to Middle East Studies Association meetings and to Armenian Studies Association meetings, where I first kind of, you know, got to see uh, uh, Elise uh, Sanasarian, etc. By the way, I was on the committee when I left. They were finding another woman, so that is the story you heard. But you know, like what is happening is that the chair told me when they called me, said that you know, it is your second year. Soon you are going to have contract renewal. Then you have to go to, uh, to uh, a tenure. This is not going to give you tenure. Then I figured, OK, what will give me tenure? Here is Quebec. Quebec is into liberation, et cetera. I know something about that. I write into, in that. He says, no, don't write in French, because what is published in French papers is not important. <laughs> write in yeah. English papers. OK, so then I decided, OK, if that's the case, I'll become chair. <laughs> and I, I didn't have tenure. I didn't have tenure, but you know, like when his term finished, people are looking, and then there's big fight. Who wants to become chair? And then I said, okay, how about me becoming chair? <laughs> they said, yeah, for sure, <laughs> because they figure she doesn't have tenure. What can she do for us? You know, like against us. You know, so that is how it works. So you have. <laughs> So you have to think a, a little bit about you know, how you can enable and have enablers encourage you to move forward. So these are kinds of the stories that I wanted to tell you about uh, before going and uh, talking about, uh, about uh, Simone de Beauvoir just very, very quickly. But something else also I now have learned that you continue looking who is putting their dime into the international civilization into we talked about transnational, etc. Okay, I come and I, yesterday I arrived, I said, okay, let me look at the Boston uh, uh, Globe, you know, and then I look at it and it says, closing the book on our bodies, because it's Judy Norsigans, our bodies ourselves, and you know, they are closing the book on it, and then they all figure that it's going to disappear, right? A few times they tried to make it disappear, but of course, <laughs> Judy decided, who I become chair of the board again. <laughs> she, she had decided to become a grandmother and not work anymore in this area. So she became a, uh, she's on the board again, and then now go, it's going to digital, and that's another thing, you know, like the digital uh, aspect of it. We have to be very careful about it. I encourage you, if you have students, send them to go and then correct what is about Armenian women and in, in Wikipedia. Because I decided, let me have a look at Wikipedia, they, they, and then whoever has written it, they say, you know, there is a high, Yerdasart uh, Hayuhi uh, in Armenian, translation in English, uh, young Armenian. Yeah, so like there's lots to correct now in Wikipedia. So there's lots of work to do. Put your students to do that. They are, you know, they are, they are savvy. They are, they are savvy in terms of these things. So let them go and correct it. Now about Simone de Beauvoir, I think uh, we are at the same time uh, now as we were uh, at, uh, at the making of Simone de Beauvoir's institute. I, when I arrived uh, to uh, Concordia, it was 1974. And uh, in 1974, I came from Wisconsin, by the way, and it was uh, Louise Sweet, who was chair of anthropology, who uh, faxed me saying that, you know, there is money in uh, educational studies. I was accepted in anthropology, but no money. So I went to educational studies <laughs> with the money, but I took all my courses in anthropology because <laughs> there was nothing, the field of educational studies was just growing, so there was nothing, yeah. So, okay, so what happened is that we were ready when the Concordia decided that it is becoming too big, it has 40,000 uh, kind of students, maybe we should create in order to give a little bit of competition to McGill a college system. Where the college system, the students come live with the professors in a small buildings, et cetera, and then do research together, et cetera, have that kind of uh, academic life uh, community. And uh, we were getting together women. I arrived in 74, and until 78, when we established the institute, when the call came from the administration, we were meeting and then trying to put a woman's course in each department. So we were from 
many departments, and we did that. And then when the call came from the administration, sent proposals, we are, want to co uh, create colleges, we were the first ones who were ready. We sent the proposal, said that we have the courses, and then we now need a space. And it was big debate, and then finally we got it, Senate approved it, got established. Now there were four or five very strong women who all wanted to become principal of the Simone de Beauvoir Institute. And then, you know, like one of them became principal, then when her term ended, another one came, and then, you know, like there was internal kind of strife. And again, you know, the dean called me, and she was a na native woman, uh, Gail Guthrie Velaskakis, and then, uh, you know, the Guthrie Museum, you know, that's her brother who runs that. And she called me, she says, look, you established the union, you, you did this, you did that, why don't you go see what's happening at your institute? <laughs> so I went, and then they went through process, and then they were all men and in the selection committee, because I still had to apply so that it looks all legitimate. And then one after the other who knew me as the, you know, as organizing the union, so will tell me, Professor Hamalian, why do you want to drag your good name in the gutter? Okay, <laughs> I said, yeah, <laughs> which gutter? <laughs> so uh, so that, that they didn't answer. I said, which gutter? And so uh, they said, are you sure you want to go become principal there? I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. The dean asked me and I will go if you agree. Okay, they said that, you know, it's your decision. So that is how things happen. And what you decide, what we decided to do is they asked me what you did then, you know, what we decided to do is change everything, nomenclature, starting from nomenclature, and uh, with a group of uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, students, we decided we don't like bachelor of, inform of uh, degree, master's degree, et cetera, so it became baccalaureate degree, magisteriate degree, so we take to Senate, Senate says, huh, Okay, so nobody can answer against it. I said, you know, it's a very good. You go to the old prestigious names, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and then they say, okay, we'll give you permission for three years to use both nomenclatures. Okay, so three years, now it's been like, you know, 30 years, and the majority of the students who graduate choose the non-sexist nomenclature. So these are the kinds of things. You change nomenclature, you change course titles, you know, and you make sure that you have always kind of people who will, are going to support you in the male hierarchy, okay? <laughs> yeah, so you don't give them the decision-making power, but they are there to support you when the need is there. Because like they tell me, you know, why do you want to drag your good name? So you are my good friend, vote for me, okay? So, so that's how it was. About, about you know, the other questions, I answered some of them in terms of you know, how do you change the, uh, uh, the courses, et cetera. Yeah, no, yeah. No, yeah, but you know, uh, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say is that you know, like, let us become enablers and think back, you will find enablers in your own lives. And then therefore try to imitate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Mary Papazian. Uh, what is more empowering than having an Armenian woman as a university president? Mary Papazian is the president of San Jose State University since 2016, the founding campus in the California State University system. San Jose State University serves nearly 25,000 students and is the only public university in the Silicon Valley. Prior to joining San Jose State University, Papazian served as president of Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut, provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at Lehman College of the City University of New York, CUNY. Dear Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at uh, Montclair State University in New Jersey, and the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Science at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. Papazian began her career at Oakland University where she was an assistant, associate, and tenured professor of English. 
Born and raised in Southern California, Papazian holds a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in English from UCLA. Her scholarship focuses on Renaissance and early 17th century English literature with a special emphasis on the work of John Donne and John Milton. She is a graduate of the Holy Martyrs Ferahian Armenian High School in uh, Encino, 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 California. Sorry, I was supposed to ask this before. <laughs> and recently was awarded uh, the Sensak and Mesrop Medal by His Holiness Katoikos uh, II. Uh, Mary is, uh, as we said, is the only Armenian woman to hold a university president position in the U.S. And we asked her to talk about her intellectual trajectory and her path as an administrator in academia. And as an educator, scholar, administrator, and mentor, and enabler, we asked her to reflect on the impact of Armenian family, community, and educational institutions on gender relations within the community and how it, this impacted Armenian women's and men's academic and professional success. Uh, what we also want to consult with uh, Mary as a university president uh, is what are the ways of creating infrastructures, programs, resources to bring the two fields, Armenian studies and women's gender and sexual studies together? I think this is the you know, hardest question <laughs> of this panel. <laughs> thank you very much. Th th thank you. And uh, can you all hear me? This is, just want to make sure. Um, RP said a lot of uh, what is the essence of what I want to say on that last point is the more that women are in positions of decision making, uh, the more possibility uh, you have to actually shape what happens. And um, I was going to start by saying, um, aside from the thank yous and, and just to uh, just uh, so much I've learned as well today, I'm, I'm the one on all of these panels that um, is not, uh, has not written feminist scholarship, though I do call myself a feminist. Um, I don't work in Armenian studies, um, but I am an Armenian woman, so I guess that makes it, makes it work. Uh, and so I'll try to speak to you from, from some of those perspectives. I um, have thought a little bit about why, why me in this position? Why was I the first Armenian uh, president of a university? And, I think some of it was an accident of history and some of it was choices that I made along the way. And I think it's important because at each step of my career, what I learned is that I reached a point where I was tired of other people making decisions. I was tired of having to put the arguments together to persuade somebody to do what I knew was right. And that the only way I could actually uh, not have to do that was to be in that next position. And then I would go into the next position and then I would, have to, I would learn it and then I would reach that point all over again. And before I knew it, um, I was a president. So that's kind of, <laughs> that, that's how it happens. That's how it happens. But. Um, uh, well, well, you know, and I'll also add as an interesting wrinkle in all of this, and um, you know, I sort of, I grew up watching Armenian studies grow, even though I myself was not personally involved with it as a scholar of, of uh, Armenian studies. And, I, and that really started from my earliest memories. I was born as, as, uh, in Los Angeles uh, from a very um, uh, early Los Angeles Armenian family. As a matter of fact, on my, father, on my mother's side, uh, my family was one of the first 10 Armenian families in Los Angeles, going back to 1905. So they came to the United States in the late 1870s, as a matter of fact, early 1880s. So it was a very early family and uh, might well have drifted from the Armenian community, as so many did, actually. Um, but it was this fluke of uh, my mom being at UCLA, uh, meeting my father, who was an immigrant from Greece, and um, suddenly becoming sort of pulled back into the community despite having grown up in an Armenian home and amongst other Armenian American families. Um, but at UCLA, when my mom uh, was in graduate school uh, studying English, uh, she met a young uh, Armenian historian actually who was writing his dissertation. Uh, and I know all of you know his name, Richard Hovanesian. And so he asked her to uh, edit his books. And so my mom was the editor of his first um, several volumes. And I have memories of her sitting in the dining room at home, you know, asking him what he was trying to say, trying to clarify language that made no sense, um, and, and really becoming, um, you know, a very much a part of, of Armenian studies, if you will, uh, if not herself an active Armenian scholar. 
And so that, that uh, I was at UCLA when uh, so much of this was happening, and I grew up, as I said, watching the community grow. I was familiar with the, um, the leaders like Sirapin Nersesian and Nina Garsoyan and others, Luis Alnabandian, because their books were in my parents' library. And I think, again, we should all buy each other's books. Let me just start by saying that. Uh, if you haven't, please do. Um, it is very important to support each other financially, by buying the books um, in terms of the reputations, by showing their interest in every one of your university libraries, make sure you make sure those books are on the shelves because if we don't advocate for, for each other, uh, who's going to do it? And so I, I was, I interestingly um, never myself went into Armenian studies and I think um, it was something I didn't understand entirely at the time. I excused it by saying my love was English. I was a native um, uh, English speaker. My mother studied English literature, and so that was what I wanted to study, and I always knew that. And so while I was involved with a lot of the graduate students in Armenian studies when I was at UCLA, and this was the late 70s, early 80s, um, I myself never actually became one of them. I sat with them in the coffee houses. I talked with them. I went to all the lectures. Uh, Richard and others said, why aren't you in Armenian studies? And I said, I love English literature, uh, which can, by the way, be just as patriarchal, just as misogynistic as any other discipline. There's nothing particularly unique, honestly, about Armenian studies to other studies. And in those early years, Armenian studies wasn't actually um, uh, even recognized as a discipline. The early scholars, my husband included, uh, studied something else and then uh, taught Armenian history classes as an extra for many, many years. Dennis taught Russian history and he added an extra class because he felt strongly about teaching Armenian history. And so it slowly became part of, of um, you know, more accepted as, as part of the canon. But I think it, it was also that way in part because uh, people who taught it also taught other things. And so they brought it into the, into the discipline. But the key is um, there are more women. If 30% of the women uh, of the chairs in Armenian studies are women, that is higher than the percentage of presidents who are women in American higher education, which is about 23% and stuck. So we need more. So to all of you young scholars out there, uh, remember that sometimes those pathways um, can lead to some very interesting possibilities for you. Um, what I found is that it was really important to be in those decision-making points. And I'll give you a couple of very specific examples. When I was um, Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences at Oakland University, we had a, a women and gender studies program, but we didn't have a major. They had a minor. And there was a strong interest by the faculty in developing a major. And they had written a proposal, and they couldn't seem to get it through any of the curricular approval processes. And it languished, and it languished, and it languished. And I was now in the dean's office. And they came to me, and they said, you know, we really want to get this through. I said, let me read the proposal. And so I read it, and I said, you know, we can make some tweaks here, and we can get this through. And you know what? We got that through in a year. Because I took an interest in it, I felt it was important, and I worked with the faculty and made sure that um, we were able to uh, defend it, make the case and make the argument in the language that other people needed to use. We tend to speak in our own language sometimes, um, and all of you know this very well because you are multilingual, multicultural in that sense. But sometimes the arguments have to be made in somebody else's language, in the language of those who have to make the decision. And that means so it may seem on the one hand like compromising hours. I said we need to reduce the politics in it. I don't, that doesn't matter. You can teach what you want in the classes. But for the proposal's sake, let's just reduce some of that. Let's keep the academic argument strong. Make it a little less threatening because at the end of the day, you want an approved program and then you teach what you want to teach. So the, the net result isn't changing. You have the program, you educate the students, and you write what you want in academic journals and you make your public speeches and you begin to change the discipline itself from the inside. You know, we work both from the outside in and from the inside out. Um, others have worked from the outside in. I made the choice to work from the inside out. I'll give you one more example when I was dean. We were running a search in my home department of English for a position that was actually my own field. It was a uh, 17th century um, non-dramatic poetry and Milton position. So I happened to know the field very well. I knew the graduate students. I knew that many of them were women as well as men. I knew many of them, actually. I'd seen them at academic conferences. 
And so as Dean, I had a chance to review the finalist pool, decide who was, you know, to approve that so they can bring them in, right? This is how the process works. So they gave me a list of two names to only two, and they were both men. And I said, uh, well, did you have any women in the pool? Uh, well, we had some, but they didn't make the cut. And I said, you know what? Why don't you send me your top 12 semifinalist uh, names and files? I'd like to just take a quick look at them. They were not very happy with me as dean for that reason. Um, and I said, there's not enough gender balance here. There's not enough balance of any kind of diversity here. And uh, that doesn't mean these aren't two really strong candidates, but are they the only candidates? Or should we be considering others? Because this is what happens. There's a lot of work to be done to diversify the faculty, to diversify um, you know, a, a gender balance and the whole thing. So they sent me those and I looked at them and I actually knew two of them, of the women that were uh, potentially finalists. And I said, what about these two? You didn't look at those. And they were, they were working with two of the top scholars in the field and they were excellent candidates. And they didn't want to give me, they didn't want to give me a good reason. They didn't want to interview them. And I said, you know what? Um, I think we're going to go back to the drawing board on this search then. And I actually closed the search. At the same time, philosophy did the same thing, but they, I went back to them and I said, philosophy, why are you only bringing in three men? Are there any women in the pool? They said, well, they gave me a very detailed, very um, thoughtful response where they explained who the top women candidates were and why they didn't feel that they were um, appropriate to bring in. And it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was honest, it had integrity, and they concluded their search, they were allowed to finish it. And so we do have a role to play in shaping what happens, in shaping the tone, in shaping the, the results on some of these things. And so I think it's important, it can be done from the faculty leadership side. I, I mean, that's, that's another avenue. There are many places where it can happen, but too often I see women um, hold themselves back and they don't, they wait to be invited into these kinds of positions. And it's something that you see oftentimes. It's important, I think, um, for us um, as women already in the field to uh, work with and create and to mentor that pipeline um, and to talk about um, you know, some of the pathways for opportunity. Um, I was fortunate to have uh, numerous mentors, both men and women, but the first time I ever found myself in a group of women uh, like this with some, some men, but just all women actually, was in a women's higher ed manu management seminar. It's a HERS program, which is, um, hosts uh, seminars for women in higher education leadership at Wellesley, at Bryn Mawr, at University of Denver. I'm now on their board. It's a national uh, organization. And I have three brothers, so I actually grew up in a, in a family of brothers. What looked on the outside like a very traditional Armenian family, my father was born in Greece and grew up in that community. And yet, because my mother, I think, was uh, grown up uh, differently as an American Armenian in the United States, I had a different perspective. And it was never, um, I was never given the sense that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Uh, and I think that might have been a bit unusual at that time, at that place. Um, and so the mentorship that, that I like to provide uh, is to say to women oftentimes that, um, you know, too often we are told we can't do these things. The truth is you just have to step up and do them. Now, for some of the stories you heard earlier today, it wasn't that easy and there were real structural barriers in place. And we all stand on the, on the shoulders of those who have come before us and we should always remember that. Um, for the, the younger generation, and there are some of you in this room who are doing remarkable work, and what I say to you is the possibilities are there in terms of bringing Armenian studies and gender studies together. Absolutely, these are two very mature programs. The interesting disciplines today in higher education are the blending of disciplines, and the academy that way may not be changing in terms of its overall structural power, but it is changing in terms of the way disciplines are, are understood. And um, do not, if, if you'd like my, my advice, don't get a joint appointment in two different departments where you have to meet two different fields because when you do that, you can't meet either because the other one thinks you're not spending enough time in yours. So uh, that is one way that that is sometimes done. So you choose one, you can teach a little in the other, you get tenure, and once you have tenure and you're moving toward promotion, you have a lot more flexibility to, to really work in both. 
But it's really important, I think, um, as you're breaking ground on new disciplines, and this is something that's happened over and over again in higher education, um, that new disciplines are opening up. The trailblazers have the hardest time, but the work you're doing is making it possible for it to become more normative for the next generation of scholars and more possible um, to provide leadership in that area. Um, I wanted to speak also to the nursing question and, and speak in a specifically Armenian context here. Um, Isabel spoke earlier about having written on nurses and how that actually didn't find any voice because nurses were absent. And that's really true. And if you look at Armenia today, nursing is very undervalued. And as a consequence, healthcare is suffering. It has real, when we ignore women's voices and we ignore women's experiences, it has real world consequences. And I work in Silicon Valley now, and if you think there is a more difficult place for women, I mean, that's, you know, in liberal California, it's one of the most inherently sexist areas, which is the tech industry, another area of really significant importance for Armenia when you think about where its economy is going. So first to nursing and then to tech. Um, when I was at Southern Connecticut as president, I, had, uh, I was invited to participate in a healthcare conference in Armenia. And I took with me a group of nurses from my university, non-Armenians. We got a small grant to do this because we wanted to impact nursing education in Armenia to help change the curriculum, to move it from a, a very you know, basic level nursing that wasn't respected and hence wasn't given the responsibility to really offer the kind of care that people need to a more advanced nursing, which is the model in the United States. And how could we help to do that? Well, when I got there and I gave that talk to this Armenian American Medical Conference of all these doctors and everybody else, they were, apparently it was the buzz because I was talking about how important nursing was, advanced nursing, and frankly, every physician in America knows how important the advanced nurses are. And essentially, you know, you have to learn this because the very health and survival of the nation is at stake. And uh, there were some enlightened men, to your point, Find the enlightened men, they are there. Many of them are in this room today, yeah, that's why you're here, thank you. But there are many also in the academy and in other places of power. Make them allies, because we can't do it alone. That's really critical. And one of these enlightened men um, you know, wanted me to be one of the group to really make this case to uh, the president, to Serge Sarkeesian, which I did. And we talked specifically about how we had to change the curriculum, how we had to give it respect, how we had to treat it differently, how it wasn't failed doctors who were nurses, who took the places of nurses. And there's an effort now to begin to think differently about how nursing education is done in Armenia. So hopefully it won't be a forgotten story in the future. And finally to technology. You know, women in tech, women have just as much talent in tech, and in Armenia, this is going to be one of the key areas. And so I want to stress how important it is to continue to develop those partnerships. And I, I will end with this. One of the best privileges I have as president is that when I say it's important to do something, it's amazing people listen. <laughs> it's amazing. So when I say, you know, I think we should have some partnerships with Armenia, why don't we go and work and see what we can do with the Armenian universities and, you know, I can make some faculty available. We have the largest engineering program. We supply the workforce to Silicon Valley. We have the expertise to help build out the capacity for technology in Armenia, and we will do it in a way that makes sure it includes women because ultimately that is how we create change. So I just want to thank you, and I'm not really in Armenian feminist studies, um, but um, anything I can do to help any of you, I'm here to help you. you, are, you, are. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's have like 10 minutes. I was at the beginning, uh, the first 
first two years actually, when I was touring around, I was shocked by the number of people that were approaching me after I spoke, mm -hmm. saying, you know, my mother, my sister, right. my grandmother, and uh, it turns out that even in the diaspora, we have these silent stories yeah. mm -hmm. that we are ashamed to bring yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna give a segue here, go further, and say that uh, we do need to speak out. I mean, I'm impressed at the level of uh, scholars, you know, women in, in, in academia, and the level of, of um, uh, interesting discourse that was presented here today. But where you make an impact within your own fields, in your own area, I don't see that impact outside and towards the community. And uh, I remember when, um, you know, my husband was trying to bring LGBT members of the, the Armenian community on the conference here, how he was punished for it by his own party and all that, and uh, for an article that appeared in Armenian Weekly and so forth. But we never hear critical mass supporting and voicing out issues. Uh, for example, take a pen name, be an, I, I have one, I, I use a male name, to make, to put, put in comments in the, the uh, Armenian community media for people to hear about these things. We don't hear enough. They don't, we don't have, and, then, and then we don't have a critical mass. And then you wonder why we only talk about genocide and the past and other things and never deal with the issues at hand. Um, we, are, we have to be in the 21st century. We cannot be anymore in the medieval times and uh, go by the Sharia law, somebody was mentioning <laughs> uh, that Armenians in Iran. Um, uh, we're following. And uh, many times I feel like we do not come out. We have to come out. And I remember I was in Armenia when the USC organized an Armenia Diaspora Conference. And some of us feminists from Armenia were uh, on Facebook criticizing that there are no women on the panel. And there are so many women available. And we need to constantly, whenever you go to a conference, please mention where are the women. They are not in competition with you. That, that we need to have more. Because this is how we get our role models. We don't even have role models in our Armenian community. I, I don't even speak about Armenia. But even in the diaspora, we do have to have representation and we have a typical mass to talk, to speak out. There is a wonderful uh, journal in California by some LGBT community that is very hushed. It's very, you know, within themselves. We need to become more transparent or outgoing, as Mary said, find the language. Could I, could I, can yes. I answer your question? Yeah, um, so in, in, we've gotten away from the divorce thing, but I think we, yeah. we all agree about that. But the, to your other points, in, in London, um, in 2001, a group of friends in, in began something called the Armenian Institute because we felt that who we were and what we wanted to do together and listen to and, and so on wasn't being done by any of the other groups, including perhaps the one that you're referring to. But, uh, and included in that was a problem where many people who were then marginal to the community were feeling very unwelcome everywhere, from church to those, those kind of groups and so on. Um, but this was a kind of a turning point, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so one of these friends took out, we, we had a little thing made up, a little brochure about who, what the Armenian Institute was, et cetera, and our first event, and people took out ads. Well, one friend wanted to put one in about the LGBT community and you know how they could join it and so on. We then took that booklet to one of the very conservative uh, Armenian community groups because we needed some space from them and they passed it around the, the, the table, and one lady said, look, look, so what's this group? And, and uh, everybody else, her group, around the table, we just, you know, we just waited. Everybody else around the group said, told her to be quiet, this is not an issue, she knows what it is, and, and you know, just stop talking about it. And afterwards, they came and apologized to us. And it was a sort of a turning point there, because before that, it had been very quiet. And, and they weren't going to welcome anybody, but they weren't going to deny us <laughs> from being different from them. This was the whole point of starting it. So I, I totally agree with you. You have to go out and you have to make some statements. Today we have 
uh, t two out of five people on our executive board are, are LGBT. So it's, it's, and they're very respected by the p other people in the community now. Well, in the morning, um, Lena mentioned that her daughters were going to uh, summer camp, and the, the pictures on the wall were all men. I mean, every single situation, we have to respond. We have yeah. to make okay. her. I did, I did good. <laughs> I did write to the, uh, uh, the manager of the camp, who then directed me to the board of the camp. The board did not respond. Uh, but the manager said he was going to do something. The following year, they added one woman. Because I was the one who intervened, they also added her on pink. And, and could I just also answer your thing about the, the conferences? I, I've also complained about that. The, the, the Gulbenkian Foundation had one with like three people, and, and then there was the whole Aurora Prize thing, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, or the Global Army. The Global Army, is that was it. So, we, so what we did, again, at the Armenian Institute was to start trying to find uh, names of women who could be available to be on conferences. <laughs> and if anybody here, uh, if I haven't approached you, please <laughs> tell me, we'll be glad to put it on. We haven't publicized it yet, it's actually on our website now. But we want to make this so that, no, but it, when I spoke with one of the men involved, they said, oh, we, we tried, but we couldn't find anybody. I said, oh, really, you didn't invite me? And you didn't invite you know, a, num a number of other women that we both know? Um, it's, there's no excuse for it, but I think we can just make it easier for them by making these things available. Uh, I have a question too for Talar Shahinyan. Um, uh, you mentioned about this literary group, Menk, mm -hmm. and about how you were studying the, uh, their writings in 20s and 30s, and there was no mention whatsoever about the genocide and about the Armenian massacres of Armenians or events associated with the genocide. So this is a very interesting thing. Because I, I grew, up, grew up in Armenia, I grew up on a diet of Eastern Armenian literature, 20s, 30s. And when you read the biggest Armenian authors, like Yerushe Charens, Axel Bakums, uh, Aveti Kisaikian, um, uh, Aveti Saarinian, there's no mention whatsoever, almost whatsoever, about the genocide, about the events associated with genocide. And some of these people that I just listed, some of them were affected by genocide themselves. Yerushe Charens grew up in Kars. Kars was taken by the Turks. <coughs> Uh, he actually fought with the Russians against the Turks, and he has one poem, Dante uh, Akanarospel, I believe, where he actually describes the killing, like the actual dead people killed, killed civilians, and yet he does not even mention the Turks by the name. So I'm curious if you have any understanding as to why people, you know, why Armenians did not talk about this uh, uh, during that in time when things that should have been such an acute subject to start with, right? And in general, it, it seems that's it's something very interesting to study, the evolution of the Armenian view of what happened to them, okay, over the last century. Because uh, clearly in the 50s, 60s, everything was very different. You know, Arun Sebak and Shiraz, all of them wrote about the, about the genocide. Yet in the 20s, it was complete, and this was like independent of ideology. You could sort of argue that, okay, uh, Bakuns and Charents were Bolsheviks, so maybe they... But Aharonian was a Dashnak, and he also didn't write anything about that. When you read their literature, it seems that they're much more interested about social injustice, as well as ideological differences. Like Charents and Bakuns wrote more about uh, what they saw as the abuse of the Dashnak leadership than about the, what the Turks had done. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Okay, so... Uh I, I, can, I, can, I can say so much about this question. Um, so the, in terms of Menk, the group Menk, um, what, what essentially I, the, the way I approach their work is not that, the, it's not that they are not representing the genocide, rather they are giving uh, representation to the catastrophe of the genocide precisely through, through absence. Right? It's, it's, it's present in the, in the absence, in, um, in the way that they are narrating the, the, um, their series of crises in the aftermath. And if we understand it from the perspective of trauma and as a trauma being something that is not processed in, in the act, but rather belatedly, um, 
within a, with another uh, within another context, um, then we can we can sort of see their work as uh, uh, an archive that speaks to uh, the impossibility of witnessing the impossibility of representation when it comes to catastrophe. Um, on the um, uh, on the other hand, I should also say that um, we have, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the genocide, um, writers like Aram Andonian, Ahago Poshagan, Zabel Yesayan, explicitly responding to the to to the events um, um, uh, quite um, directly. Um, the, then there's also the uh, uh, another question, and I, I, I don't want to veer too much away from the topic at hand here. But then there's also the question of um, the language that becomes available in terms of uh, genocide and diaspora, which kind of um, develop in tandem um, after World War II, um, and, and and this is an interesting pocket to look at because um, just as um, in these various publications, uh, not only their f fiction but also in period periodicals, just as the genocide is being referred to as um, uh, the, 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 the mass deportations, Aged, catastrophe, chart, massacre, um, et cetera, in this kind of pluralistic manner, diaspora also is not in circulation, um, not until the, 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 the 40s does it become concretized as spur ashkhar spurk, um, and in this uh, period, uh, Armenians are referring the dispersed are referring to themselves as Tsirvazuchun, dispersed, uh, uh Turkish Armenians, Kahutahaychun, uh, So this it is an interesting uh, period to to study, um, and, but but I wouldn't argue that they're not writing about it. They're just simply not writing about it in the way that, from our current contemporary perspective, um, we we see we conceive of the genocide having this really coherent narrative. Uh, I think there was a question there, maybe one last question. Uh, did I, I thought I saw a hand here. Okay, the last question. Um, I have a question about herstories in education, because I'm an Armenian school teacher and I teach mostly language, but I know eventually I'm going to have to do some high So I'm wondering if there's any, <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if there's any plans possibly set in motion to make some sort of archive with a more balanced, gender balanced Armenian history available to teachers on the ground. Is I, 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 guess, or, yeah. and, yeah. I guess that there is a lot of work to be done in terms of actually producing the material. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know from being in education that there is something we call the hidden curriculum. And it doesn't matter what book you are reading, it is matters how you present it. And what you can do is you can start sending the students to go and research some of the period and find women who were significant in that period. That's one way of doing it. I went to the MIT uh, co-op and I see that Clinton's uh, daughter Chelsea is writing and they persevered. And what she has done is she's taking all these women who were hidden and then showed how they persevered in all different areas, you know, in civil rights, in uh, science, in et cetera, et cetera. So you can uh, kind of make up for the absence of materials by asking the students to write about women of that particular period you are studying, yeah. You mentioned Mar Margaret Atkar. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Apgar also, yeah, because yeah, it is it is also at the like, co-op. You can go have a look. Yeah, yes. the first woman mentioned yeah. is an Armenian yeah, in that it book. Yeah, is an Armenian. Yeah, yeah, that is another thing. That's what I was saying. You know, I go to the co-ops, I go to the papers of the day, wherever I go. It's not to look for Armenians because I used to go <laughs> and look at the, the telephone directories, right? <laughs> <laughs> like you know, Krikor, Krikorian. I can figure out the names, etc. So feel good. I would never contact them or anything, but feel good that there are <laughs> Armenians here. Stop. But but now now I have changed tactics. I'm seeing you know what we are contributing yeah. to the general history, to the general literature, to the general, you know, uh, power relations, etc. That's how, you know, I got lucky. I, they had the, uh, our bodies ourselves in the paper, big, and then, you know, I walk into the <laughs> MIT thing, and it's, yeah, uh, Apgar is the first one that was uh, uh, featured, yeah. So do that, do that wherever you go, find things so that you bring it to the classroom. And then bring grandmothers, mothers, you know, and their stories are amazing. You know? Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. That last note was great, bring grandmothers and mothers <laughs> to teach, really, seriously, yeah. revolution. Yes, yes. thank you very much for coming.